Uh, good evening, friends. Tonight's talk is again from the Dhammapada. Uh, most of the Thursday talks, or all of them, uh, will be on the Dhammapada until I conclude this um, 26 chapter series. Uh, tonight we're on chapter 18, uh, a chapter known as the Malavaga, um, which loosely translates, translates to um, s remaining stainless or the stainless sutta or the stainless chapter. Uh, which refers to, uh, and the sutta itself refers to the importance of taking to the Dhamma immediately and with the understanding that it is um, entirely possible, but in fact the sole task of a, a true and wise Dhamma practitioner to awaken in this lifetime. Uh, the, this short chapter is an, is an emphasis on the importance of prioritizing Dhamma practice over all other, or maybe let me put it this way, over any distractions from awakening. Um, let me just, let me read it. It's enough introduction for this, I think. Uh, but I'll comment as we go along. The Malavaga from the 18th chapter of the Dhammapada. Aged like a withered leaf, death awaits. Immediately the Buddha gets to the point that if one is to awaken, you better do it now, because no one knows when the end is coming. You are near your departure, yet you are unprepared for your journey. And so that is just an accurate statement for someone my age or 100 or 120, as it is to someone who's 5, 15, or 20. I'll read it again. You are near your departure, yet you are unprepared for your journey. The Buddha is not simply referring to the end of a physical life. He's saying that we are stepping out from reality or maybe already are outside of reality. We have departed um, from true understanding of human life in an ever-changing environment, and yet we are completely unprepared for it. And the preparation is the Eightfold Path. The Buddha continues, be an island unto yourself, so says the wise, the wise sage. Engage in right effort, and the Buddha's description of right effort is the effort that is taken to integrate and practice all of the entire Eightfold Path. Engage in right effort and become wise. Become rid of all impurities and become stainless. Enter the abode of the awakened ones. It's simple and direct instructions. Um, if we wanna enter the abode of the awakened ones, we'll get rid of these impurities. Life is fleeting and you are now at the end. And again, that is an entirely, entirely appropriate statement no matter where we are in our in this current life cycle life is fleeting and you are now at the end death rules the ignorant what another powerful statement for for a human being to remain ignorant of four noble truths for their entire life from birth to death death has ruled that life and, and when the buddha refers to death that's what he's referring to he's not within the framework of the dhamma he's not referring to a physical death or or keeping this uh birth death cycle churning he's saying that a life ruled in in a life lived in ignorance of four noble truth is not life at all it's a living death there is no rest along the way yet you are unprepared for your journey because of that initial ignorance of four noble truth be an island unto yourself so says the wise sage engage in right effort and become wise again become rid of all impurities and become stainless End the pain of birth and constant decay. But it, it, what, again, it's such an important line. We talked about this this past week and in this series about the Buddha, the Buddha's true meaning on uh, in use of the word rebirth and has nothing to, very little to do with future rebirth, but the importance of recognizing that in this moment, if we are holding in mind the principles of the Eightfold Path and are framed and guided by those principles, then this moment holds the potential to continue to become awakened as opposed to a mind rooted in ignorance that in this moment and every unfolding moment holds the potential to only become further ignorant. That's why we incorporate the Eightfold Path. And this speaks to that. Moment by moment, one by one, a little at a time, the wise Dhamma practitioner removes impurities as a skilled smith removes dross from silver. A little bit at a time. All that we have to do 
and the, the Buddhist teachings say this over and over again, there's, there's, we're, we are, as a society, we want so many quick fixes or the, or the next romantic or novel fix, you know, the next, the next psychological uh, application, uh, psychological theory application that's gonna fix our broken self. The Buddha realized that that's all a, a, uh, a fool's excursion and that he, he taught an eightfold path to recognize that it is ignorance of Four Noble Truths that drives all that type of foolish behavior. And that a little bit of a t at a time, as we incorporate the eightfold path, recognize fabricated views one by one. There's a, the, the sutta that I'll be, I think I'll be teaching it next on retreat, but it talks about ending fabrications one after another. That's how we do it. Rust devours its own base, just as misdeeds devour the mind of fools. Something the Buddha said 2,600 years ago, and boy, is it still relevant today. Neglect destroys the home. Sloppiness destroys personal appearance. Mindlessness destroys the guard. Non-repetition destroys the Dhamma. <laughs> I just love that line because there's so much repetition in the Dhamma, and I think a lot of times, and I would say even in my teaching, I repeat a lot of the same themes, but that's the reason that this isn't, the Dhamma isn't entertaining. It's not supposed to be a distraction. And if we have to keep revisiting and repeating over and over again, basically the same teachings, it's because we want to awaken. We're not looking for entertainment or distraction. We don't care if it's, uh, if it's not exciting or that's the next mind blowing concept. It's just the Dhamma. And a little bit at a time brings us to the shores of awakening. And that's, that, that's how Dhamma is practiced. Unchastity stains men and women. Miserliness stains the giver. Stains are indeed always evil. Always evil things. So there's nothing good to be found in a, in a world and a mind that is generated by fabricated views. Nothing. A worse stain than these, this is what I'm referring to, what I just said, there's nothing worse. A worse stain, uh, Buddha says, <laughs> the reason why I'm saying there's nothing worse is because all of that is, that foolish behavior is rooted in the worst stain of all. A worse stain than these is the stain of ignorance of Four Noble Truths. The Buddha says, destroy this one stain and become stainless. Easy it is. I think I'd comment on that. Do this one thing and become stainless. Do this one thing and become, as far as a Buddha's description is concerned, become awakened. Easy it is for fools, meaning developing this process. If you're stuck in maintaining your ignorance, this is it's very easy to keep maintaining distraction. Easy it is for fools, stubborn as cows backbiting, unrestrained, arrogant, and corrupt. Difficult it is for the truly humble one who seeks the stainless to be free of all entanglements, unassuming, pure and wise. Fools take lies. They utter lies. Fools take lies, sorry. They utter lies. They steal. They take another spouse and are addicted to drinking drugs. They dig themselves up by the root here and now, meaning at the root, we're cutting off our own lives, our own opportunity for a meaningful life rooted in understanding of Four Noble Truths. Know this, friends, the Buddha continues, evil is difficult to control. So the next line is, is saying, so don't invite it into our lives. Evil is difficult to control. Do not let greed and wickedness bring you ongoing misery. It's up to us. This is an important teaching on karma that we're talking about this week in class. We don't have difficulties in our life because of, of past misdeeds or some ridiculous arbitrary spiritual system of behavior modification that's, that's providing punishment and reward. That's misery. People respond to worldly events based on their mindfulness, meaning what we hold in mind is going to determine the experience, including if we hold in mind foolish so-called Dharma principles, principles ignorant of Four Noble Truths that they don't lead to awakening, then all we can, can expect to get out of our so-called Dharma practice 
is more foolish behavior and more foolish ideas. If we incorporate the Buddha's Dhamma as our Dhamma practice, as our Dharma practice, and keep that pure, that's another thing that Buddha is referring to. In other words, um, avoid the need to so compulsively keep adapting and embellishing and accommodating and adding new novel and romantic ideas. I'm not means the same thing. And finding the next, uh, the next breathless commentator on their own insight, develop the Buddha's Eightfold Path if one wants to actually develop the Buddha's Eightfold Path. If you want to develop something else, that's fine. But just understand that you're not practicing a path that an awakened human being taught. People respond to worldly events based on their mindfulness, either meaning that a mind that is rooted in, in holding in mind ignorant views is drawn to those types of worldly events that continually confirm and validate those views. So the Buddha is using an important um, reference to mindfulness here. Mindfulness is, simply means to recognize or to hold in mind. We can hold in mind anything. And, and, and usually in the problem of ignorance is that a mind rooted in ignorance will be mindful of or hold in mind anything that obscures wisdom and allows that mind to continue to ignore its own ignorance. That's an aspect of mindfulness. The Buddha taught a very specific application of mindfulness, and that is to be mindful, to hold in mind as the framework and guidance for awakening, the Eightfold Path, the only mindfulness the Buddha ever taught rooted in the four foundations of mindfulness where he refers to that directly towards the end of that sutta. I'll say that once more that I said it two or three times already. People respond to worldly events based on their mindfulness. So if you want to know why or what difficulties may be arising in your life and your own reaction to it, and maybe your own confusion, uh, your own anxiety, your only fr own frustration, maybe with life or your, your Dharma practice, it's because of what you're holding in mind. So if you find that your Dharma practice isn't taking you where you hope it goes, even, even though it might be providing great distraction, even if it feels good at times, look at what you're holding in mind. Because what you hold in mind is going to determine your experience. And if you hold in mind, if you decide to hold in mind the Buddha's simple eightfold path and be mindful of not adapting, accommodating, or embellishing that, you will awaken. That's, again, that's what this chapter is about. So it's much of the Buddha Sutta refers to what is most important to hold in mind so that we can awaken now in this lifetime, not just use our Dhamma or Dharma practice as more entertainment. Those upset by others, others' fortune cannot develop concentration. <laughs> Those whose discontent has been destroyed completely will develop concentration. That discontent with living a life rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths. Nothing burns hotter than lust. Nothing grips harder than hatred, including hatred of the Buddha's Dhamma or aversion to it. Another side, another way of describing that. Nothing grips harder than aversion. Nothing grips harder than aversion, than hatred. Nothing entangles like delusion. Nothing continues ignorance like craving, including craving for the next best thing or craving for more Dharma practice that is simply just social engagement or this, this, this common modern Buddhism of Buddhism by common agreement. We crave for that. We, in fact, the more we get a, a commonly agreed on theme, no matter how foolish it is, we simply, we cling to that. We crave for more of that. Nothing continues ignorance like craving. Others' faults are obvious. One's own are difficult to see, including the, the, that idea of association, the, what, who, we, who and what we associate with, those faults or transgressions will be very hard to see too because we rationalize them away. Others' faults are obvious. One's own are difficult to see. The fool ignores their own faults and can only see the faults of others. <laughs> Even the Buddha was, was often told by others that his Dhamma was, was nonsense and he was... He was not what he, he presented him. They were so intent on maintaining their own false dharma, and maybe they weren't real, they didn't realize that it was a false dharma. Most people do realize what they're practicing. In order to protect it, they needed to find fault with a true dharma. And, it's, and this is also a general teaching on just simply um, always finding fault with others and also finding fault with ourselves constantly. Always seeking others, seeking others' faults. 
The fool's defilements grow. They are far from cessation. And this relates again, just directly to what I'm talking about, the very specific application of impure Dharma practice or Dhamma practice and pure Dhamma. Those that are practicing ignorant Dharma or those that are simply living in ignorant light are far from cessation. And the Buddha continues by saying, there is no hidden path or other understanding than his own teachings. Fools delight in the things of the world. Wise Dhamma practitioners are free of worldly entanglements. And that's, that's the, greatest, uh, the greatest development or the greatest ongoing gift of the Dhamma is being free of worldly entanglements. Again, the Buddha re reiterates, there is no hidden path or understanding or other understanding. It's just this. It's just what the Buddha taught. All fabrications are impermanent. All fabrications, no matter how, how much, how enamored we might be with our fabricated Dharma practice, they're all impermanent. They're always going to prove to be disappointing. The Buddha con concludes this by saying, awakened minds are stable. That's another way of saying an awakened mind, a mind that has developed deep concentration through the soul meditation practice that the Buddha taught, Shamatha Vipassana meditation, that is able to support from that well-concentrated mind, that concentrated mind is able to support the refined mindfulness necessary to hold in mind the entire eightfold path, that's a mind that is stable. That's today's, uh, today, tonight's talk, this evening's talk. Uh, on the Malavaga. Uh, next week will be on the 19th chapter uh, from the Dhammapada. If you find benefit from this talk or many of the others uh, on my website, please consider a donation at becoming-buddha.com. Thank you. Peace.